now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling. We read a little bit of this earlier. They're grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And so he told them this parable. Which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and he rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the whole house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, so if you have ever spent any time working in a restaurant, raise your hand. You two online, have you? Maybe comment. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, and so I worked, uh, I worked at a place called Max and Irma's, uh, in that, um, Chris, where's Chris? Oh, is my husband not here? Oh, okay. He was here. I was, that's weird. I was like, I'm weird that I don't know where he is. Okay. Um, so we worked at a place, um, in the mall that kind of went out of, um, out of business, but we worked together. Uh, and then we worked at Ruby Tuesdays for a while, um, Chris and I both. And um, I would have uh, nightmares. Anybody else have nightmares when they worked in restaurants? I would have nightmares. I would sit up in the middle of the night. And um, my dad would, said, well, and I was in um, college, so I, and I was a commuter, I was at home. My dad would say he would hear me mumbling in the room, and he'd walk in the bedroom. And um, I would be sitting straight up in bed, putting in orders like this in a micro. Um, and, and doing it frantically, and then, and then laying back down, and then sitting back up, and putting new orders in. Um, uh, these night terrors are a part of um, restaurant industry. Uh, it's, and if you ever have worked in one, it immediately conjures up those memories of packed tables, and malfunctioning equipment, and orders piling up over and over again, so fast that the kitchen can't even process them, and, and all kinds of frayed nerves, and, um, and like everything is about two seconds from breakdown. This, uh, this series uh, is The Bear. It is actually a sitcom. So like the others, picking shows for this series has been trying to pick shows that are shorter. We don't want them to be full dramas. Um, it's, uh, but Parables are short, shows short, but this one is unlike any of the others. Um, for all the awards, it has classified itself as a comedy. If you have watched The Bear at all, you would be hard pressed to figure out how this show is a comedy. Uh, it, uh, it's what maybe they call a, um, a dramatic comedy, which means that the comedy is only related to helping you get through some of the deep, dark things of life. There is one character that kind of plays a role as a little slapsticky, but the majority of what makes the show funny is the completely toxic breakdown of relationships that's happening in that place. And, and the way everyone talks to each other uh, in a way that I cannot show you any of those scenes in worship. <laughs> uh, so only what I can show you are the moments that are, um, that are deeper, uh, more reflective. I wish I could show you the funny moments here. Um, but it is 
utter chaos. I remember when I first started this show, um, I thought, why so much yelling all the time? Why are they yelling? It's just so much yelling. If you're a person who loves your peace, um, it will stress you out watching this show. Um, it, it, the intensity builds, um, and there's these quick cuts between characters that capture them peeling carrots or browning like giant slabs of beef. And, um, and the effect is that it feels like as you watch it, if you uh, have worked in the restaurant industry, it feels a little bit like PTSD. Yeah. Weaving in and out from different corners in the kitchen as the kitchen completely implodes. The bear is horrifically stressful. I have, to, I have to tell you, it is a stressful show. But it's also unbelievably thrilling and Im- ambitious and funny. I promise I can't show them, but it is. You got to watch it. Um, and it's also devastating and it's real and it's poignant and it's my favorite show on television right now. It might be like climbing up on the list for me as one of the best shows I've ever watched. And some people have called it the new Ted Lasso, the darker Ted Lasso, because it's not about a kitchen, just like Ted Lasso is not about soccer. (laughs) It's about the, the, the inner workings of these relationships and how connections form and completely break down as it relates to each individual person's past and trauma um, and experiences. But I wanted to give you a first a, a sense of the chaos. This is about, if an episode is about 30 minutes long, this is normally about 20 minutes of every episode. All the fries from the steady chef behind. Not system. What is this system? Michael's system. That's Carmen Dennis the girl. Yeah, that's Sydney. She's helping us out today. Michael's system makes no sense. Look, Gary, you set up a compost for me today, chef. I have to do my thing in the place. It's very clear. Thank you. Behind, behind. Hey, chef, is there like a family shop or something? Behind. Shelf. Sorry. Um, see, uh, como la comida extra para usar la comida familiar. Ah, sí, la comida familiar. I cut something out there. <laughs> Bots on the right side of walk in. Thanks, Chef. Yo, the corner. Yo, family. Yo, you. The program started four hours ago. You know why I ain't the kid all morning? Excuse me. Listen, what is going on with Bulbers? My instance is completely like blown up. Yeah, I got the, what is that, a disc? I got 36 <laughs> followers. <laughs> <now. I'm laughs> So from the beginning, the bear is steeped in, this, in the merciless rituals of the kitchen. At first, they are completely chaotic uh, and completely not normal for Carmi, the main character. But as time goes on, uh, a rhythm begins to form there. Uh, and they, um, they take on what is um, called a brigade, um, which in a professional run kitchen, um, it's like this cruel hierarchy of, um, of distinction, um, but um, it, it's, it's important for these relationships to start also functioning better. Um, Carmi um, has been trained in a, um, in a top restaurant, um, and he is this um, soulful, doe-eyed, kind of sad um, character who has all of a sudden, out of nowhere, received this family sandwich shop that is uh, unlike his training at all in fine, um, in fine dining, but he's received it from his family after, um, after his, his, his brother dies by suicide. And everyone in this restaurant has been used to, has been used to functioning in this chaos functioning in, uh, in, in this complete um, disorganization. And so uh, the first main relationship that is formed uh, here is it's necessary to move the show from the chaos you see there um, to a show where, where, where Carmi has a partner. 
Um, so I'm going to introduce you to this character, and then we're going to move forward to our scripture for today. This is Sydney, and this is how Sydney meets Carmi. Hi. Hi. I'm Sydney. I called about the soup position. I'm establishing today. Right. Gosh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. 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 Carmi. Um, hey. Here, give me your. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, linear smoke vec. That's some serious heat. What's a. Uh, what's UPS? That's in Chicago. Or? Uh, United Parcel Service. One. That's the, the mail. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what'd you What'd you do for them? Drove. Paid my way through culinary school. So. CIA. Uh, CIA. Yeah. Okay. So what are you doing here? You know, this um, this was my dad's favorite spot when I was a kid. Come here every Sunday. Special place. Good. Um, okay, so you know the drill. We uh, you're gonna make family. It's meat plus three, and we, we eat around two. Yeah, her. Dope. Cool. What's up? Can I just like ask you a question, maybe? Of course, yeah. I know who you are. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I mean, you're the most excellent CDC at the most excellent restaurant in the entire United States of America. So, what are you doing here, I guess? Making sandwich. <laughs> this place puts Carmi through hell, not just because uh, Carmi has inherited this very poorly functioning business that's in debt um, beyond belief. Uh, he also finds out that Michael, his brother, had been doing some dealings um, with maybe some people in the neighborhood that were more illegal dealings. He's not exactly sure the extent of it. Uh, he, he comes into this kitchen with all of these various characters, with all of their own baggage, and none of them in the right positions, none of them, um, none of them living to their potential, um, the kitchen is gross as it could possibly ever be. It's a hell for him. And he immer immerses himself in his brother's world to see how he could have possibly missed what led Mikey, his brother, to be so lost. <clears throat> and to take his own life. And so the way out he, he, he finds um, comes by asking for help. He comes in and telling everybody what to do, telling everybody what to do, and not realizing the potential in front of him, not realizing the potential in each individual person, just brigade, French brigade, this is your role, chef, this is your role, chef, this is your role, chef, until he realizes that there is going to not be any building of relationship. There's not going to be any. They're going to continue to think of him as the enemy, the one that went away, the one that, that didn't come to Michael's aid when he needed him, the one who is now the, um, the superstar coming back home to their cute little quaint restaurant until he begins to see what their potential is, until he begins to, to, to pour into, into what they need, into what they care about. Um, one of the, my favorite scenes um, is is when he, he starts to see the potential in Marcus. You all right? Um, I was behind on cakes, tried to speed it up, and I blew the fuse. Strong's insane. Yeah, it could go from chill to unchill in a second, but you gotta stay ahead on your work. That's just that. Er, well, my first job was McDonald's. You don't need to be creative, you just, Work with robots and everything's automatic and fast and easy. I won't make a mistake again. Yeah, you will. But not because you're you, just because. I started a fryer fire. Night after I won food and wine, special chef nearly burned the place down. For real? For real. And this weird thing happens, too. You have this minute where you're, you're watching the fire and you're thinking. If I don't do anything, this place will burn down and all my anxiety will go away with it. And then you put the fire out. Then you put the fire out. And dispersed between all of these chaotic scenes, these new relationships, this building rapport, 
with the people who have been there much longer than you. Almost every episode, there is a flash. Um, a, little, a, little, um, a little sign that leads us to, to know, if you pay attention, um, the deep Catholic heritage of this family, this, uh, this Catholic Italian-American family. And in each, in each episode, at some point in time, in between the chaotic kitchen and the words of advice, you get a little flash of a card that's laying on his desk. Uh, it's as Carmi is slumped at the desk that belongs to his brother Michael, looking at all these unpaid bills, all of this disorganized, um, just mess, trying to figure out why in the world his brother gave the restaurant to him. There's this little, this little flash in every episode of a prayer card. It's, um, it's a prayer card likely that was a card that was given um, as a, fu- a part of the funeral um, for his brother's life. And um, there's a, on one side of it is a picture of Jesus um, with the lamb thrown over his shoulder. On the other side, the words of, from a book of Daniel, um, my God hath sent his angel and closed the lion's mouths that they may not hurt me. This little flash of a card of Jesus with the lamb thrown over his shoulder. The thing about uh, the Bible, I've, um, if you read it enough, you start to, to notice, um, though it's not particularly associated often with, um, with a party, you start to notice how God really just loves to celebrate and to root on what's been lost. Love, loves to celebrate that which has been lost and has now been found. And I think this little card, this little flash every episode is this little nod for us in this show to, to think for a second of what has been lost and to guide us on this journey through this beautiful story towards who and what might be found. Let's take a look at the scripture one more time. Notice it says, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And so Jesus tells them um, two parables. Later on in the same um, chapter, Jesus tells them more parables. But which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 to go get that one? And which one of you, if you lost a coin, wouldn't just turn over your entire house looking for this coin? If you're looking to be in relationship with God, um, it seems like, God wants to celebrate that which no one else would celebrate. God wants to seek out that which no one else would seek out. Um, We get this from all throughout the Bible. Um, God's people, the Israelites, have been enslaved in Egypt for 430 years, for four centuries. Their God has been Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has told them when to go to bed and when to get up, and when to eat. And and after four centuries of bondage, God's people have just become so very lost. It's hard to have any hope when you are in chains. It's hard to have hope when you are riddled with anxiety, when you are bound by trauma you have not processed. And so then enter uh, Moses, and he comes in, he leads God's people out of bondage through through the Red Sea and into the promised land, and, and, and transformation begins to happen here. People who used to be slaves, who were lost, are are now found and free. People who were in bondage are now liberated. People who have been cut off from God. And all those practices that are central to God's people now have have freedom to celebrate 
to celebrate each other, to celebrate the wins, to notice the little moments of change. And so it's like God is saying uh, here, and, and what I, I think you see all throughout the bear is like, hey, folks, like if you are going to be a part of my way, you're going to have to learn how to celebrate each other until everyone feels found. And so um, go further into the story at the end of Leviticus. It's like just this invitation from God to God's people to join in this, <coughs> hey, um, hey, we're going to, to not spare any expense to make sure everyone is a part of this party. It's one of the ways we recognize Jesus also when he comes along and starts saying things that are very similar to that, like today, they're, they're grumbling against him, grumbling. If you watch this show, majority of the first season is just these people grumbling against what, what transformation might happen. Jesus, all these grumblers, and, and Luke's gospel, like, says we really just wish that he was, he was much more like John the Baptist. Why can't he just be more like John the Baptist? Why can't he just be more like Michael? You know, he looks miserable, like he's like, like he, he's always so serious. Why can't he be a little bit more, you know, just laid back? Um, I know, you know, like religious life, like you look like those stuck up people. You look like those religious people. But Jesus, Jesus um, just seems to be this completely other thing from what they wanted, what they expected. He can't possibly be religious. This accusation is thrown at Jesus over and over and over again. And, and then we get um, like Jesus hearing that accusation responds with a couple of stories. Now, which one of you, if you had a hundred sheep, would leave all of them and go search after the one And, and you go, that would be really stupid. That would be really dumb to leave the 99 to go search for the one. If you were a, a, a shepherd, you would never do that. But this is what Jesus does. And which one of you, if you just lost a quarter, if you just lost a quarter, would you turn over every chair in the house would you turn on all the lamps and search and search and search for hours for this? The point is, we're supposed to say not one of us would do that. As we go through the story of the bear, you notice, I mean, season one, you just feel like, why hasn't he just gotten rid of these people? Why hasn't he just cut them out, leave them out of the story? Leave them out of the story. Leave them behind. The, the one that keeps, that keeps derailing the team, the one that always has something snarky to say, the one whose attitude is bringing down the entire crowd, you want them to be gone. And it's like, it's like this show just keeps pulling them in and bringing them in and doing things, including people and making room for people much longer than we would ever make space for someone over and over and over again, this desire to, to make room for, for all to be found, for all to be transformed, for all to be changed. One of those stories um, is the story of Richie. Uh, Richie and, and Carmi have, have quite a... a a background. He calls them cousin. Um, not really cousins at all, but this is that kind of Italian, uh, <laughs> Italian Chicago Catholic family where everybody's ca called a cousin. Grew up with his family, best friend to Michael, his brother, and you can tell from the very beginning that Richie um, felt left alone to deal with, with Michael's um, with, with all of the emotional baggage that Michael carried with him, Richie felt completely left alone and has no respect for Carmi, who goes off and creates this beautiful life for himself at one of the top restaurants in the world, has no respect that he would leave the, the, 
the toxic family to go seek his own thing, and especially now that he's back. And Richie makes every ounce of this transformation, this restaurant transformation, as they finally find money to back it up, as they finally get about 80% of the team working together in this French brigade that is um, that's making really actually beautiful food, noticing that Marcus actually has a gift for pastries. He sends Marcus off to go train under a pastry chef, um, noticing that, uh, that um, that Tina has, has a real gift for leadership in the kitchen. He, he sends Tina off to go, to go train um, in a leadership role, noticing um, all of the gifts that Sydney can bring to the table with her experience and, and her background and her culinary training. He makes, he makes her his partner, like on the same journey together and even invites her to sign a contract to open this brand new restaurant, no longer the beef sandwich food shop, but this, what he hopes will be a Michelin star restaurant, the bear. And so they begin turning this over, but there is this one character, this one character, Richie, who just will not let the party happen. (laughs) He will not let the party happen as everything seems to be functioning well. He does not understand. He does not understand why we have to have all of these lists of rules, why we have to do everything, um, why we, Carmi starts changing the menu almost on a daily, weekly basis, and that just seems like too much for him, and he is always complaining. And so he sends even him. He sends even him to one of the best restaurants uh, to train under some of the chefs that he trained under, but to train to maybe Help him see why, why they throw this party to begin with. Why they do this thing to begin with. To train and get the... He, <laughs> Richie could, not any given day, you didn't even know how he spent his time. You didn't know what he was doing. He seemed like he was always creating more problems than adding to this working kitchen. And so he sends him off to learn maybe, maybe he, will, he will fall in love with this too. One of the best scenes in the whole um, show has been watching this character, Richie, um, find himself, find his passion, um, find a place within this, and you want to root on them just getting rid of him from day one. Let's see um, the transformation of Richie happen a little bit. That was a clean. I've been doing this for nine hours. I think I know it's clean. I'm telling you that's not clean. That was not clean either. Please do them properly. Yeah. Lord. <laughs> do you think this is below you or something? Man, I think I'm 45 years old polishing forks. No one is asking you to be here. I don't think anybody remembers your name. Nice try. You think I don't know how hard it is hiring people since COVID? We don't have that problem. You really drink this cooler, no? Yeah. I do. Why? Because I love this, Richie. I love this so much, dude. Did you know that when this restaurant opened 12 years ago, it won the best restaurant in the world the same year? It's retained three stars because we have a waiting list that's long. 5,000 people waiting at any given moment long. Do you see their faces when they walk in here? How stoked they are to see us and how stoked we have to be to serve them? It takes 200 people to keep this place in orbit, and at any given moment, one of those people that is waiting in line gets to eat here. They get to spend their time and their money here. I'm sorry, bro, but we need to have some forks without streaks in them. Every day here is the freaking Super Bowl. You don't have to drink the Kool-Aid, Richie. I just need you to respect me. I need you to respect the staff, I need you to respect the diners, and I need you to respect yourself. Change. No more forks. No more forks. Look good. It was kind of like armor. Yeah, man, that's the point. Start with tables 10, 20, 30, 40, so forth. Stagger the reservation by 15 minutes. We do not stack the kitchen. Start with the two tops, move to the four, so forth. All the servers take temperatures of the room, they communicate. How do they do that if they can't speak? This is our hamachi. You can see that it's frozen liquid nitrogen and curled served on our basin shell. Mm. 
Bogey's on 19, walk everything fast. Yeah. Hey, Chef, what are all these different colors in there? Orange is a dietary restriction, yellow is out of town, green is a VIP, and blue means kitchen tour. And what about those notes? Table 15 likes to eat faster, so we speed up their tickets. 23 likes it slower, so we add an extra moves not to back up the kitchen. 22 doesn't like people to speak to them. How do you know that? Know what? How about the people eating? We have a designated staff member that researches each guest. Yeah. What's that ticking? Wait list. The minute somebody no shows or cancels, we pull somebody up. How do we get here that fast? I'll go set a bar. Gangster. Okay. Eyes on four. 24 walking in five. Yeah. Two. Tasting of booze on deck. Get them out fast, please. Thank you. 12 walking out. Let's pick it up. Every second counts. Yeah. Three. Going to 21. Pick up two hamachi, please. Yeah. Eight walking in five. Triple check five, please. White chocolate allergy. Yeah. Every night you make somebody's day. Huh? You ask me how I can do this, and that's how I can do this. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you. Three, going to 21. Uh, one minute, table desserts, please. 19, go. 20, go. Full 18. Full 18, chef. You, we have a birthday on 24. Pick up a cake, candle, and two balloons, please. Kill 31. 33, go. Pick up wet you, please. And 19, walking in four. Yeah. 305, hands, please. My Uh, one of the t just um, last season, last season, uh, the, which because season three is out now, uh, in season two, two episodes um, that season have been uh, noted um, by by critics as two of now two of the best ten individual episodes of shows ever made from that season. One of them is that one where you watch Richie's transformation happen over this episode. This, um, this character who was unbearable, unbearable. I mean, I can't show you any of how unbearable he was, <laughs> um, is now this indispensable and beloved part of the show, of the restaurant, of this team, and it seems like this series is this series about cooking and restaurant ownership, but it's really this, this series about grief and growth and community and, and what it's like to be lost and the journey to being found. I also think that's what these, um, these little Catholic illusions, these little flashes throughout the show give us a glimpse of these little grace notes of the faith, they, like, they communicate this family's shared struggle, this family that's not actually a family, it's like the family you choose, shared struggle um, and loss in their search for peace. And, and, and in this, um, it's kind of this show full of lost sheep. There's this re repeated presence of the image of this good shepherd who throws the sheep over his shoulder, the one that he left all the 99 for. It's as if everybody is always capable of being found. This comes to a head, though, um, at the end of, of season two, uh, when this beautiful restaurant they have been creating, this beautiful restaurant they've been creating, this thing, Carmi, his face is all over this thing, his name, his reputation, it's his restaurant. His whole life he was called the bear, and it's called the bear now. Carmi is so concerned about everyone else finding their thing, so concerned with seeking out the lost sheep. We've seen it. We saw it happening. He has not been dealing at all with his own, his own level of being lost since his brother's death, since having this restaurant, and in the midst of, of tending to everything else, he forgets to have the repairman come to fix the handle on the freezer, and on opening night of this new restaurant, he locks himself in the freezer, the CDC for this new restaurant, not at the helm of it. 
letting this chaotic staff take over. This person he sent, Richie, the one who was unbearable, the person he sent to be found is the one now who has to run this restaurant while he's stuck in a freezer. I want you to see that scene. Five minutes. I got you, Chef. Great. Tia, I want you to help me set plates, please. Yes, yeah, Chef. Thank you. <laughs> been found, and in the process of being found, uh, Carmi has descended into this complete world of disillusionment. He thought he was at the helm of this, and everything runs while he's away from it, and now he has to deal with his own, his own lost sheep nature. That's where season three picks up. Those of you who haven't watched it yet, I'll leave that um, um, for you to watch, but uh, it's, it's this beautiful story of how each one of us, there's room for each one of us to be found. Let's pray. God, you make room for every one of us, all of our junk. The person that we absolutely cannot stand. Maybe that's not a real person, but maybe that is a perceived person. Maybe somebody who votes a particular way. Maybe it's someone who does have a name. And God, the God we get in Jesus is one that is constantly leaving all the ones that have figured out how to stay together for the one that is alone and isolated. The one that wanders off, who doesn't follow the rules, who never listens. God, thank you for doing that for us in the moments when we have been the wandering sheep. Even now. And teach us to pray as Jesus does. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.